The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me and your copy of Holy Scripture to the second chapter of Genesis. We'll read verses 15 through 16 there and then find ourselves in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was good to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her. I feel like I have to say that for all the women in the room. I just always have to emphasize that. Who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Great God. We come now, Lord, praying for your Holy Spirit to speak. To speak through the words of Scripture. To speak, Lord, through whatever words I may try to place in the way. God, that we may hear your Spirit speak to us. But, Lord, more than that, may we hear and obey. May we hear and be changed by your word as you are in this place, speaking them to us. Lord God, be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as most of you, or some of you know, uh, this past week I turned 33, which I know isn't very old. Uh, I know I can hear some of you already. Um, despite what the gray hair and my creaky knees say, I know it's not old. But those 33 years have come with an awful lot of miles. And I don't necessarily mean actual miles, though we have been all over the world. I mean they've come with a lot of experiences, a lot of stories, a lot of trials, a lot of pain, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of difficulty. Maybe more than anything, they come with a lot of sin. And sometimes when... When I am in those quiet moments, you know, when you can't sleep at night, and you look through the blinds to try to count the stars, when your life gets real quiet, like a thunderstorm over the horizon, I can hear it rumbling. And those sins, and those pains, and those trials find their way back into the playhouse of my mind. I think about often when I was a child, how mean a big brother I was to my sister. I mean, I was mean. I used to beat my sister. I mean, I'd just whack her on the head for no good reason. Until I remember, I guess I was 11 or 12, in the kitchen, had a knife in my hand. I had been spreading peanut butter on a piece of bread or something. Stephanie came in the kitchen, gotten on my nerves, for some reason, reared back and hit her with a knife in my hand. Didn't cut her, didn't scratch her, but I remember dropping it 
I'm thinking, I really could have hurt her. Never did it again. But I think. Or when I was a little older, about 14, walking home from school with a group of friends I always walked home. I I said we looked like a a little United Nations. There was me, the white boy. Philip, a a black kid that walked with us. John, his family was from Mexico. Uh, Stephen, his family was from Puerto Rico. Tony was Italian. And then there was Jason, the redneck. We all walked together (laughs) home. Tony was the last one on the way. We usually went to Tony's house to watch Dragon Ball Z because we were cool kids. Or we'd play basketball in his driveway or wrestle in the backyard. Tony was sort of the bad boy among us. Every once in a while, we'd catch Tony with a cigarette and thought he was really bad stuff. But I remember one day walking home. Tony didn't have a cigarette. We were all cussing, cutting up as kids do. If your kids tell you they don't cuss, they're probably lying. Or they're really good kids. Well, that's what we were doing. And Tony, Tony looked over at us and said, man, I wish you guys wouldn't say that stuff. I said, man, what are you talking about? He goes, well, I've, I've been going to church, trying to do right, trying to get my life together. We all laughed, and of all the people in that group, I made fun of him. I did. I think about that in those quiet times. Or when I was a senior in high school in Spanish class, in front of me sat my friend Ryan. I had known Ryan probably since the first grade. Behind me sat Daniel, a friend I had known probably as long. We got up to leave. We are walking out in the hall. Ryan said, did you smell that in class? I said, yeah. You see, Daniel, I always liked Daniel, not as a friend, but because if I was poor, Daniel was always poorer. Daniel lived in the trailer park in town with his mom and his grandmother, wore old clothes. I may have wore the same clothes, but Daniel's had holes in them, wore out shoes. He was always a little bit bigger than the rest of us, sweated a little bit, kind of smelled sometimes. I remember walking down the hall. Ryan said, did you smell that? And I said, yeah, Daniel was really bad today. And about that time, I felt Daniel brush past me, running down the hall. I think about that. I think about that. I think about when I was working in the shop, riding on a service call with a guy named Lee. I was new in my faith, sitting in the truck, riding back together. Lee asked me some deep, profound question. I could feel, I could feel it was the right time to say something, the right time to mention to him that I was a believer, that I had had my life changed by this Jesus he was asking about. And you know what I did? I turned the radio up, and I kept driving. I think about that. I think about that in every single time that I have failed. Every time. It plays over and over. I try to center myself and quiet myself, and it comes rumbling back to the front. Here's where you messed up. Here's where you messed up. Here's another sin on the tally. Here it is. And then I go and read this. You all have heard this story. Probably one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. I'll be honest with you, I was frustrated when I saw it happens on the first Sunday of Lent. A story that reminds us, that reminds us that we're broken. It reminds us that we messed up. It reminds us like a storm over the horizon when we're all happy clappy and in a good mood, here it comes rumbling up reminds us. You know what happens when we read the story? It's the same thing that happens in those quiet, dark times when our minds try to remind us of all the bad things we've ever done. Do you know what we do? It's the same thing. Instead of finding an answer, we find more questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the ancients had this story and sort of a way to answer the question, why is it all bad? Why do brothers hit their sisters? Why do people fight? Why do people hate one another? Here's the story. Here's what happened. But instead of an answer, it just gives us more questions. Why did God put a tree in the middle of a garden that they couldn't eat? Why didn't he just leave it out? Really? Why didn't God just leave it out? Beat all this business. He knew we were going to mess up, right? Or did he? Did God know we're going to, what's about free will? Does God know what we're going to do with it? Why? Why did God do it? Or we ask another type of question. 
What if, what if Eve had just said, go on, serpent, scatter on somewhere. I ain't got time for this. God said not to eat it, and I ain't going to eat it. What if? What if instead God said, well, you know, I, I know I told you not to, but that serpent, boy, he tricked, because you know we do that, don't we? We do something wrong, and what do we say? The devil made me do it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get rid of the devil. You all just stay here in the garden. What if? That's what we do. Why did that have to happen at that point in my life and make me mess up? What if I had made that phone call? What if I didn't make that phone call? What if I had never crossed paths with that person? It's what we do. When we're reminded of the evil and the wickedness in our own lives, we start asking questions about it. But you know the truth. The truth is those questions don't really get us any farther along because they're never answered. They're not. And so I read the story again, and I read the whole story, and I find hope. Because you know what the very next thing is in the story? Now we know, we know, right, if we've read it, what does God do? Boots him out. But that's not the very next thing that happens. The next thing that happens is that God walked in the garden and was looking for them. God still comes looking for us. God still comes. Listen to that. God still comes looking for us. You mess up, God doesn't say, I'm through with you, throw them in the heap. God still comes to look for us. I'm also encouraged by the fact that I have to fold my Bible over to hold that little flap down, because that's a really thin part of my Bible. It's the beginning. You can't judge a journey by its beginning. You can't judge your journey by its beginning, can you? How many of you want to be known by what you did as a child? I sure don't. How many of you want to be known by what you did before, before you met Christ? I don't. It's the beginning of the story. It's the first step in the journey towards the cross. Yes, the garden reminds us that we're broken. But the cross reminds us that God is going to put us back together. The garden says, you messed up, you're broke, you failed, you're sinners. But the tomb, when it's empty, it says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We find hope in that. We also ought to find conviction in it. If it doesn't matter for me, and it doesn't matter for you, or the person next to you, or the person who's not here. God said, oh yeah, you messed up, but I'm putting it back right. That's what the cross says. And that's what this table says this morning. We set out on this journey. Some of us started it just a few days ago with ashes on our hands and our heads. And now we set out toward the cross, towards Calvary, towards crucifixion, and towards blessed Easter morning. But as we set out, we are reminded, yes, we are broken. But God's going to fix it. God has fixed it. And he's fixed it in the body and the blood of Christ. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, Lord, when we reflect and are reminded of our own brokenness, the brokenness of our sins, God, help us to not be overcome by grief or regret, doubt or fear. But God, help us to give those things up and to take up your love and your grace and all that you have for us, and all that you have given for us in your Son, Christ Jesus. Help us, God, even this morning as we are reminded of the fall, of this, 
entry of sin into our lives and into this world. Lord, that you have overcome it. Remind us, Lord, as we take this bread and this cup that your body and blood, the great act of love you have given to us, has overcome whatever act of sin we may commit. And God, that your love for us goes deeper than any act of betrayal we could ever, ever want to commit. Lord, be with us as we take from this table. Cleanse our hearts and our minds, God. May we confess to you before we even take the bread or the cup what it is that keeps us from you. Turn it over to you, Lord, that we may be forgiven, that we may eat from your table in a worthy manner. So, Lord, be with us now as we take from your table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.